Welcome to our welcome everyone to our 10th and final author this evening in our writer speakers and ideas series for the semester. Generally speaking, these take place on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. and each talk or event lasts about one hour. If you look in the chat box, I have the link to a list of our events at, at our website. Uh, and next semester we have another excellent slate of guests and we look for look forward next semester to seeing you at those talks too. My, talk, my contact information is also in the chat box, john.m.bar at lonestar.edu if you want to get in contact with me about this or any of the future events. Our speaker tonight is anthropologist Melvin Connor, MD, PhD from Emory University, who answers attacks on faith by some well-meaning scientists and philosophers. An Orthodox Jew who has lived his adult life without such faith, Connor explores the psychology development, brain science, evolution, and even genetics are the varied religious impulses we experience as a species. Now, the format for the evening is very simple, that I will turn this over to Mel after I give a formal introduction uh, to him in just a bit, and then he will uh, talk about his new book, uh, Believers, Faith and Human Nature. And uh, after his talk, we will take all Q&A. You can type your questions in the question and answer box, or you can type them in the chat box. It doesn't make uh, any difference to me. So uh, Melvin Mel Connor is the author of The Tangled Wing, Con Biological Constraints on the Human Spirit. His last book was Women After All, Sex, Evolution, and the End of Male Supremacy. And just to give you an example, Women After All looks like that. I would highly recommend that. Uh, I've used it in classes before. It's excellent. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is Mel's favorite book of all that he's published, uh, The Tangled Wing, Biological Constraints on the Human Spirit. Am I right about that, Mel, that this is your favorite? This still is, yeah. yeah. I thought. <laughs> uh, well, well, women, after all, is, a, is getting to be a close second. Right, right. So uh, Connor was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2016. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was a member of the Board of Trustees of the Russell Sage Foundation from 2000 to 2010. And he has testified twice at US Senate committee hearings relating to healthcare policy. He wrote the regular column on human nature for the sciences, the prize winning magazine of the New York Academy of Sciences. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Newsweek, the American Prospect, MD, Psychology Today, Omni, Ms., and other newspapers and magazines. And he's reviewed books for Science, Nature, Scientific American, the New York Review of Books, and the New York Times Book Review. His scientific writings have appeared in Science, Nature, the New England Journal of Medicine, Child Development, Human Nature, and other journals. He has been a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and the Foundation's Fund for Research in Psychiatry. And re he received the American Anthropological Association's Anthropology and Media Award for 2004. His distinguished lectures include the 15th Annual Raymond Pruitt Lecture, the Mayo Clinic and Mayo, Mayo Medical School Lecture in 1995, the McGuthrum Lecture in Medical Humanities, Yale University School of Medicine in 1996 and the Abraham Flexner Lecture at the Vanderbilt School of Medicine in 2009. He was named the best local intellectual, I love this title, in Creative Loafing's annual Best of Atlanta edition for 2004. He attended Brooklyn College, holds PhD and MD degrees from Harvard University and is Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor in the Department of Anthropology and the Program in Neuroscience and behavioral biology at Emory University. He spent two years among the Kung Bushmen and has taught at Harvard and then at Emory for over 40 years. He teaches courses on human biology, human brain behavior relations, biological approaches to childhood, human nature, medicine and society, and the anthropology of the Jews. Connor was raised as an Orthodox Jew and though he lost his faith at age 17, he is still keenly interested in Jewish culture and civilization. For more about this, see his other website, Jews and Others, in addition to the Women After All website. 
He was married to Marjorie Shostak, uh, <clears throat> author of the anthropological classic Nisa, The Life and Words of a Kung Woman, and the mother of their three children, Susanna, Adam, and Sarah, all now grown. He was a single father for a decade and has two grandchildren, among other rewards. His wife's, his wife's eight years with cancer stimulated an interest in that disease and in the psychology of terminal illness. He is remarried to Anne Kale Kruger, PhD, a developmental psychologist who added a third daughter, Logan Kruger, to their blended family and has found happiness again after much suffering. I should also say that Mal and I met while waiting for a plane at the University of Missouri at a conference and struck up a friendship that's now lasted for several years. And we're so happy to have you here, Mel. Take it away. I will make you a presenter right now. And it's all you. Thank you so much, John. Um, I, I just have a slight update, which is the third grandchild that uh, um, was brought into the world by my uh, by my stepdaughter Anne's daughter uh, back in December and um, um, I, I uh, am thrilled about uh, uh, about that addition to the family I also um, want to thank you um, uh, from the bottom of my heart for that excessively generous introduction. I don't, I don't know if they write uh, thank you notes in heaven, but if they do, my mom's going to be tossing one <laughs> off to you uh, sometime in, in the next couple of hours, I'm sure. Um, so so and and by the way, that that uh, that plane flight, which I think was a little delayed when John and I met was one of the luckier uh, air air travel experiences I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, John, John, John mentioned that I attended uh, Brooklyn College. It was all that my um, my parents could afford, and it was a very good education for me. And when I saw the the Lone Star um, um, kind of pitch that said uh, uh, "stay near to go far" or worse to that effect, uh, and uh, that reminded me very much of my own my own background and my own college education because. From the bedroom uh, that I had as a child, I could see the, the clock tower of Brooklyn College, uh, and and that's where I ended up studying. Um, and a good education it was. So this this uh, sticky note is still on my uh, on my <clears throat> laptop, um, and it is something that I made when I was starting this project. Um, a, a list of some of the things that that someone would have to try to explain or understand if they really wanted to be, to to uh, have a comprehensive um, um, explanation of religion. I, I I won't go go through this list. You can you can read it uh, for yourself. You can see also that it contains a lot of very different things. And if you if you try and think about about the evolutionary origins of religion, or if you try and think of how the human mind uh, generates religion, or how um, uh, how human children develop a a, uh, a a gift for 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 faith and and a, and a practice of religion, um, you can see that it's a lot more complicated than most people. Uh, ever try to approach in in uh, in behavioral science uh, evolutionary science and psychology um but uh fools walk in where angels fear to tread so my book my little book believers does does try to address a lot of these things now my my book isn't uh about uh different specific religions, but I, I have had experience of different uh, uh, specific religions. Teaching uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks um, uh, was a great privilege that I and my wife had in 2013 and, uh, and in 2019 again. Um, and, and there are some nuns in the background here also. Uh, and and uh, uh, in the course of this, so so we were there because of the uh, the the Emory Tibet Science Initiative, which resulted from the Dalai Lama's um, 
an uh, in, intense commitment to uh, to teaching uh, science to the to the monks and nuns, and he has he has made that a life uh, uh, ambition of his, which has been very successful. And now some of these very uh, young men are out teaching <coughs> um, various aspects of science themselves. Uh, but at the same time, we got an education in 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 Buddhism, uh, and needless to say, and here are some some fundamental concepts of of, of Tibetan Buddhism that I tried to understand. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I I, I was asked to do is uh, lecture on on the self and the brain, and um, and in that I, I apologize for coming to the. Uh, uh, to the world center of uh, understanding uh, of the self and denying denial of the self, and trying to talk about self uh, uh, from a scientific viewpoint, and and I was corrected. As you see, this this is this is crossed out because the correction was um, you can't deny the self if the self doesn't exist. And what we in Buddhism try to understand is uh, the non-existence of the self. That's different from the denial of the self. So that was one of the the, the very uh, new concepts for me that I tried to understand. And this is my uh, two minutes of fame with the Dalai Lama, who accepted uh, my gift of, of the book that John uh, was talking about. Uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> So in the course of our travels in India, <coughs> uh, we pursued a, 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 an interest in in uh, uh, in Hinduism, which of course is the dominant religion of India. Although India has given an, an amazing welcome to uh, the Dalai Lama and his followers uh, since 1959, um, when they had to flee, first flee to bed, and most and most of these. Uh, uh, young people, by the way, uh, walked across the, the Himalayas uh, in order to get to India, <clears throat> and, and with the, with the Chinese army and the, and the Nepalese police close on their tail, and that includes the uh, women. One of the one of the most brilliant students there was a nun who who uh, was applying like like a number of monks had done to come to Emory for two years to study uh, on our campus. And, um, and since she was one of the first nuns, uh, if, if not the first, um, uh, the, the interviewers asked her um, if she thought she was ready for, for America and, uh, and if she knew what, what a rough and tumble place it was. <laughs> And uh, so she gave a brief precy of her experience crossing the Himalayas, uh, one step ahead of the Chinese army, and uh, and she said, "I think I can handle America," uh, <laughs> and she did very well. But at any rate, um, you know the the one of the paradoxes, and one of the, that, I, and and one of the the goals I had, I set for myself at the beginning is that. Um, you know, if you're going to explain religion, you have to explain everything from Buddhism, in which there is officially no god, uh, to Hinduism, uh, in which there are hundreds of gods, uh, at, at least nominally, and uh, and the the devotion of people to these to these different, uh, very different religions, both of which uh, have have uh, have very mystical ideas. And uh, ideas that are not uh, supported by scientific evidence. Uh, why do people have such commitments? Why, <clears throat> why are the commitments so different? Then do the different major religions have something uh, in in common? So this is a Hindu holy man in a shrine to Shiva, who is often represented as a as a bull, and um, that that. Um, uh, it, it is one of uh, numerous gods that are that are celebrated in in Hindu life, and 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 some Hindu theologians will tell you that these are just uh, these are not really multiple gods. They're they're 
different manifestations of God. But I can tell you that as an anthropologist, that uh, uh, on the ground, it certainly looks like people are are uh, are, are carrying on devotions uh, of a serious nature to to different gods who are all connected to each other in the Hindu religion. Um, I'll show you uh, a few a few photos from our experience in India in 2019, and and we happened to be uh, to be there. In fact, we shortly we arrived at, at this monastery we were teaching shortly before um, uh, Sakadawa, which is the holiest night of the of the Buddhist year, and 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 the temple is filled with row after row after row of, of hundreds of, of, of monks chanting. And um, and here uh, you see uh, uh, children who are who are monks in training, um, lighting candles outside the temple uh, later in the evening. And and I want to emphasize the 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 fact that. Um, how religion develops in children is, <clears throat> is extremely important. How faith develops, and and um, and in every religion, one of the main purposes of every religion, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, is to is to support the uh, the family in its in its uh, um, momentous task of bringing up the next generation in in a uh, an orderly and moral world, um, and here you see uh, we, we, uh, Westerners, non-Hindus, are not supposed to go into Hindu temples, but because our friend, uh, this this Buddhist monk, uh, had contacts, we were able to get into this very small temple to uh, to Shiva, uh, and and uh, you know we tried to be discreet, uh, but. There was one man praying, and there were children playing in the temple also. And this is they were they were very comfortable there, and they were obviously being influenced by the uh, by the environment. In that same small town, there's a beautiful mosque, <coughs> uh, and and this is another mosque uh, on the Arabian Sea. Uh, the uh, the number of Muslims in in India is such that if uh, if they were a separate country, they would be the largest or, or second largest Muslim country in in the world. So this, this is, in India is a, an extraordinary place, and it also has uh, scores of millions of Christians. And we had the privilege of of uh, visiting this cathedral with uh, the guide <coughs> who was um, a, a devout Christian himself, and. Uh, and he took us to meet uh, the nuns and children at a, at a, at a convent school uh, very near the cathedral. But but really, uh, scores of millions of Christians in, in Hindu in India and hundreds of millions of, of, of Muslims as well. And uh, because of my own traditions, I, I wanted to visit uh, uh, Jewish India much smaller, but still uh, uh, still remembered uh, in 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 some places, and um, and still active in in other places. Uh, we were actually invited uh, to uh, a ritual circumcision in this synagogue in in uh, Mumbai. Uh, but but we unfortunately were leaving uh, India before uh, before the circumcision took took place. So just just to give you a little flavor of of, <clears throat> of my own background, I, I I when I was a child and, and young young adolescent, I took the stories in the uh, in the Jewish Bible very seriously. Uh, one of which was. Um, of course, the story of the flood and, and Noah's sacrifice and God's promise not to uh, n not to destroy the earth again, uh, at least by by flood. Uh, and the reason being the that uh, God comes to understand that the imagination of the heart of man is evil from his youth. Uh, and so here's an example of the um, 
uh, uh, the heart of man evil from his youth. That's my bar mitzvah picture. And I was uh, uh, as evil as the next kid, I guess. Uh, and and um, uh, but I was growing up in the, in a religious framework, and um, I think that gave me uh, a, a greater than average ability for for uh, the, the 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 typical academic. A greater than average ability to to get inside the head of of, of people of faith. I I was at this uh, demonstration um, when uh, Dr. King delivered the "I Have a Dream" speech. You can see me right there, or maybe it's here. I'm not sure, uh, I, but I'm somewhere in that crowd. And I was it was two days before my 17th birthday, and it was it was not lost on me that the the <laughs> The language, uh, the biblical language that I was brought up with, had become the language of this vast movement that that was changing America, uh, and and um, and inspiring uh, 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 millions of people to 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 make a, a positive change. So the la the last uh, personal. Um, um, <clears throat> Ex religious experience that I'll tell you about is that uh, during the course of my uh, two years of, of, of research among the, the Kong uh, or Junkwasi uh, Bushmen, they're usually called, of, uh, of Botswana, <clears throat> I became an apprentice in the, in the trance dance religion. I won't tell you the details of it, but it's a, it's a central religious ritual and the central healing ritual of this uh, hunting gathering culture uh, women are are um, sitting around the circle around the fire uh, uh, they are are singing and clapping in a, uh, uh, in, in syncopated rhythms and and singing in a in a sort of yodely fashion which uh, helps men uh, go into trance uh, and and uh, but mostly it's dancing in a, in a in a circle m monotonously hour after hour, and this is the morning after a whole night of, of, of dancing. And after a certain amount of that, uh, certain men, uh, especially, uh, uh, it, it's, not, it's not rare, uh, let's say it's common for, for, for men to, uh, uh, to have some ability to go into trance. When they go into trance, they're considered to be in danger, and other healers help them, uh, protect them from throwing themselves in the fire, running off into the bush, and so on. Um, and then they can go around and, and lay on hands and, and, uh, uh, and, and heal or cure uh, every individual who's around. And that, uh, whether you're sick or not, it's good for you. It's kind of like vitamins if you're not sick. And um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, considered protective. And the, the the men go through this this process of trembling, and and when they shriek, uh, the particles of illness that are inside the uh, the sick person or or potential illness uh, particles uh, in a healthy person uh, flow up through their arms and and are shot out of their uh, the nape of their neck, back into the um, the spiritual world uh, where they came from. So they believe that that illnesses is, is and other uh, hardships are sent by by the gods, and there are multiple gods, uh, uh, some of which are malevolent and some of which are are childish. And and you will see them uh, at some points in the night uh, stop and and turn out and. And look out seemingly into the empty bush, but then they start yelling at what they perceive to be the visiting gods uh, and, and spirits who who they berate for um, uh, for bringing misfortune on humans. There, there's nothing really reverent about about their approach to this, and you can you can see this in in. Uh, uh, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, many of the Psalms uh, uh, express uh, disappointment and anger against God, 
uh, for abandoning uh, uh, people and and uh, even even uh, Jesus of Nazareth on the cross says, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" And uh, and this this seems paradoxical because uh, his divine uh, uh, being knows in advance what is going to happen, and uh, yet his hum human side um, is questioning God and and uh, and protesting and saying, "Why have you forsaken me?" And 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 so there is there 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 are are more things than uh, than uh, reverence and 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 worship in in people's attitudes toward God. And this is a visit we made in in two thousand five. Uh, in which uh, a little girl I had uh, studied in uh, in um, the 1970s was now a grandmother uh, was going into trance. So women had become uh, trance dancers, and the and the fire uh, is is something um, sacred in. I won't say every single religion since I haven't had experience of that, but but in so many different religions that, that you have to wonder um, whether that hasn't been a universal way uh, since since fire, since humans controlled fire uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, if that hasn't been a way uh, that humans have of accessing the part of themselves that is most uh, spiritual. So let's get to uh, what people... Uh, Say about religion. So religion is the opium of the people, according to Karl Marx and, and his uh, hundreds of millions of followers. Uh, an illusion, albeit possibly one with the future, according to Sigmund Freud and his uh, many followers. And according to Darwin, um, something very complex, consisting of love, complete submission to an exalted and mysterious superior, a strong sense of dependence, fear, reverence, gratitude, hope for the future, and perhaps, perhaps other elements. So um, Darwin is not quite right here, as we've already seen. It, it, it isn't complete, always complete submission to an exalted uh, superior, uh, and it isn't always uh, reverence and gratitude uh, and hope, but, but it is a... Um, um, it is something that Darwin uh, contemplated. His wife was very religious. She thought she was very worried that he was going to burn in hell, and and uh, and he was very torn uh, about um, about the uh, the challenge, the perceived challenge that his work was uh, uh, was sort of throwing, perceived to be throwing at, at, uh, at, at religion and religious leaders. Um, and, and he never saw a necessary uh, conflict there. Now, um, John, did you say that there's a question in the chat? Uh, they'll be, yeah, they'll be coming up. They'll come along. Okay. Uh, people are typing those from time to time. Yes, correct. Should we wait? Uh, yeah. Well, with those. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, quite extraordinarily, in private, uh, he, 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 Darwin wrote to uh, uh, a man of the cloth who was a friend of his, uh, and this was the year, year, the year after the Origin of Species was published. He felt he said, "I feel most strongly that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. A dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton." <clears throat> a very very interesting analogy, and not exactly uh, um, evidence that that Darwin uh, per, uh, perceived his project as as attacking religion. And in fact, uh, in in uh, most editions of the Origin of Species, the last the last words <coughs> on the last page, I don't have that here. But say um, uh, very close to um, you, you know we can. We can appreciate the, uh, the 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 idea that that um, life started out in a very simple form, and and that the spirit of life was was breathed by the creator into one or a few simple forms, and that uh, uh, 
the things most most beautiful uh, uh, have been and are being evolved. So so he was not he was not consciously uh, making an assault on on religion, um, unlike some philosophers and scientists, especially in 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 the twentieth and and twenty uh, first century. Uh, I I I have <laughs> put Russell's rule in quotes because. This is abstracted from many of Bertrand Russell's, Russell's writings. And basically, I think um, uh, he, he, uh, he said, um, in so many words, it's better not to believe in things for which there is no evidence. Now, you might uh, a- actually, we might actually take note that at this point, that this is a value judgment. Uh, there is no way to prove that it's better not to believe in things for which there is no evidence, uh, uh, or at least to prove that that what you should exclusively believe in. Um, and and, uh, and so it's preference, uh, and and not everybody shares it. <clears throat> I went to a conference at uh, in in uh, 2006 called Beyond Belief uh, at the Salk Institute. Which was meant to launch uh, a scientific assault on 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 religion and and eventually elim- eliminate religion from from the world. And uh, a keynote speaker was uh, Stephen Weinberg, Nobel laureate in theoretical physics. Uh, and he said, among other things, the world needs to wake up from its long nightmare of religious belief. And uh, quite extraordinarily, uh, I think he he went on to say, that this might be the most important thing that science contributes to human welfare and civilization. Uh, waking the world up from, quote, long nightmare of religious belief, unquote. Um, when you think of all the contributions of science, it, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that that, that, that was, would be what he would possibly put in first place uh, in, the, in the scientific agenda. But others at that conference uh, were willing to speak even more strongly. Richard Dawkins is uh, a distinguished evolutionary uh, biologist in, in Britain who, who wrote a book called The God Delusion. Uh, and he says, if this book works as I intend, religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. Um, Sam Harris wrote uh, around, around uh, at the same time, in the mid-2000s, The End of Faith, uh, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason. And uh, you can see that the title already contains the concept uh, in this quote, the days of our religious identities are clearly numbered. And uh, this um, distinguished philosopher, Daniel Dennett, um, who's done a lot uh, uh, that I find cause to admire, um, said a uh, book called uh, Breaking the Spell, uh, and, and said, among other things, I, for one, am not in awe of your face. I am appalled by your arrogance, by your unreasonable certainty that you have all the answers. And um, all I can say is that the religious people I know don't think that they have all the answers although they do think that they have some answers for themselves. And, and this is uh, the, the, um, the famous author, Christopher Hitchens, uh, who, who wrote a bestseller called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Uh, and he says, philosophy begins where religion ends, just as chemistry begins where alchemy runs out and astronomy takes the place of astrology. So... Uh, Hitchens was uh, uh, was uh, uh, as arrogant. In fact, all of these uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, as I sometimes call them, were uh, um, as arrogant, uh, at least as the most arrogant religious people I've I've known. But I must say that Hitchens, who died a, a, a difficult death of cancer. Uh, uh, some years ago, uh, w- was uh, uh, was poised and brave in the face of his of his death, and and uh, and he uh, uh, disproved the adage that there are no atheists in foxholes. 
So what is it? What are their arguments for, against belief? One, the, uh, there's no evidence to support uh, <clears throat> religious claims. Science has closed the gaps. What is called the, called the soul is just brain activity. Religion has evolved uh, just like any other human trait. Religion causes violence, hatred, and war. And religion is the opium of the people, lulling people so that they don't act uh, in their own behalf to improve their lives. Um, God, uh, second, God's is the product of yearnings for a perfect parent, reward and punishment, companionship, meaning life after death. In other words, a lot of, uh, uh, of wishful thinking. Three, religion more generally is the product of human yearnings for identity, belonging, a sense of superiority, which is a, a, a remarkably uh, constant uh, feature of, of most religions uh, that have existed. Uh, blameworthy enemies and, and narrative, which is very important. People need stories that, about, their, uh, about their origins and about the... Uh, People need stories that make sense out of the world, uh, which is often uh, seems chaotic and and um, uh, and meaningless without stories. And then all sacred texts contain errors, lies, contradictions, highly implausible histories, silly and cruel behavior of gods and religious heroes. Uh, this is all uh, absolutely true. Uh, they do contain those things. But here's the thing. None of these objections is in the slightest way new. All have been heard or thought of by most intelligent people. None has posed a serious obstacle to belief for the majority of believers. And there's a quality, there's a quality in, uh, in, in the um, statements made by these scientists and philosophers and, and pundits that, oh, I, you know, oh, Look, there are errors and contradictions in the Bible. Uh, you know, God is cruel sometimes. Babies, uh, I, you know, one of the one of the scientists at uh, uh, at the conference I mentioned, Beyond Belief, was was the famous astronomer um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he it was a gigantic screen for projection, and he 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 projected twenty foot high. Uh, uh, photos of deformed newborn babies and said, how can you believe in God when this happens? And, and, and you know, it's not that that's a bad question. It's just that these guys, these, and most of them are guys, present uh, um, these things as if they hadn't been thought of before. And, and of course, the slightest <clears throat> acquaintance with religious people, religious texts, uh, religious history will show you that uh, the people uh, who have maintained faith have done it in the face of deformed babies and wars and, and famines and countless other things that, uh, that seem illogical in the world. And, and, um, but these scientists and philosophers are not asking them how they, how they work that out in their minds. They're just, they just think that well, I'll tell them about the deformed babies. I'll tell them about the contradictions and, and self-contradictions in the religious text. And then, as, as Dawkins says uh, in The God Delusion, after they read what I have to say, they'll, they'll give up their religion. <clears throat> so if there's a delusion uh, in this field, uh, um, that's one of them. So how, how can it be that... Uh, that this doesn't pose a serious obstacle? And the answer is faith. So, um, what is that? Well, it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And um, that is what it is. And, and uh, that is the first thing that one has to know about, about faith and, and, and about religion. And it's the thing that, that these scientists and philosophers attacking it have somehow been blind to. Uh, they, do, they do show some indication of, of approaching uh, recognition of this at some points, like Harris who says, religious faith forms a kind of perverse cultural singularity, a vanishing point beyond which rational discourse proves impossible 
And I say, yes, that's what it does, Sam. Get over it. And, and, but they, 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 they can't get over it um, because they think that religion is evil and, and, does the, and that most of what's wrong in the world is due to religion. In another book, uh, Dawkins, in a remarkable self-description, uh, says, I remember once trying gently to amuse a six-year-old child at Christmas time by reckoning up with her how long it would take Father Christmas, that's Santa Claus, to go down all the chimneys in the world. The obvious possibility that her parents had been telling falsehoods never seemed to cross her mind. Now, this is a six-year-old uh, um, whom... Uh, uh, Professor Dawkins is trying to talk out of believing in Santa Claus uh, uh, and using logic. And wh what you, uh, what, uh, what, I, I've summarized a bunch of research on, on children's beliefs in Santa Claus and how, it, how they age out of it and how they cling to it and how even their parents uh, uh, wish they wouldn't give it up. Um, but it, 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 it's rare that you you see an instance of somebody actually trying to take it away from a child. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it's it's indicative of of the attitude of of these critics of religion that um, uh, number one uh, logic is the only thing that matters and and. Uh, and number two, if you if you see the logic, the illogic of of uh, of um, religious and other uh, uh, strange beliefs, mystical beliefs, uh, magical beliefs, then you you'll automatically give them up. Well, Connor, uh, me, I might answer that religion is natural to think because it's built into the brain. Not every brain, but many brains. Uh, it's influenced by genes. It develops in childhood, and it evolved through natural selection. And I tried to summarize the evidence for all those four claims in in, in the book. But I want to just back up a little bit to uh, William James, uh, whose classic uh, varieties of, of uh, religious experience. Uh, uh, significantly subtitled the study in human nature um what was which were delivered at uh, uh, at edinburgh in 1901 to two um so james was was the founder of scientific psychology he was um uh a very rigorous uh, experimenter in in psychology and and uh uh, contemporary of Freud's, but much, much more uh, scientific than than Freud and his approach to testing his hypotheses, and and wrote the first textbook of psychology, which basically has the same chapter headings as the modern textbook of psychology. Uh, nevertheless, he was he was a deeply religious man, and he commented on what he called medical materialism. He was perfectly aware of uh, geniuses in the religious line and have often shown symptoms of nervous instability, led a discordant inner life, had, a mel had melancholy during part of their career. They have been liable to obsessions and voices, seen in visions, presented all sorts of peculiarities which are ordinarily classed as pathological. So he understood all, all, all the, the potential diagnoses that you can give to, to saints and, and yogis and, and uh, and even founders of, of, of new religions like like uh, Buddha and, and Christ, and and yet uh, it didn't change his faith. He thought that this that these um, special brains that that these people had was uh, basically, in so many words, I'm putting words in his mouth a little bit, but not much. Uh, basically, God's way of leading them to uh, new religious discoveries. So he thought that faith could be explained by brain science and psychology, but not explained away. Um, I can talk about this distinction some more uh, in the question period if you want. I, I, I have a new friend in Madrid who's, who was translating, uh, finished translating this book into uh, Spanish, and he asked me uh, to, to 
to try and parse this for him because he was having trouble figuring out a way of saying it in, in, in Spanish. But if you're having trouble with it, uh, I'll try and explain it better. He was a trained physician, a fa the fo de founder of scientific psychology and a person of deep lifelong faith. And, um, and he did not um, consider uh, using neuro neurological observations, uh, which, which he considered perfectly true about, about, uh, about religious experience uh, he, and even psychiatric uh, uh, observations did not consider that to be invalidating to, to faith. And, uh, uh, and I think that, uh, that I uh, dwelt on, I've dwelt on that for, for a while because that's my approach. If, if you explain faith, uh, uh, using brain science, genetics, <coughs> child development, uh, evolution, uh, you know, which we haven't been able to do yet, but if you could do it, that wouldn't explain it away. That, that would just be, as a religious person might say, well, that's just how God constructed the system so that, so that people could have faith. Now, there've been a lot of, there's been a lot of strange things about, um, about faith on the brain, religion and the brain. And, uh, and this um, uh, neuroscientist, Michael Persinger, uh, invented something called, or thought he discovered something called the God spot and used ultra weak magnetic stimulation of the, of the temporal lobe, which is sort of here. Uh, if you put your fingers in front of your ears, you'll be in about an inch away from the temporal lobes of your brain. And, um, and he claimed that people had religious experiences, uh, and, uh, Here's God in a cartoon objecting to the idea that he exists in a certain spot in the brain. Uh, and, uh, but Richard Dawkins uh, subjected himself to, uh, to this stimulation in a BBC uh, 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 Horizon uh, series experiment. And he, he said uh, uh, all he experienced was a sort of a twitchiness and then he was very disappointed. And of course, um, he was very disappointed, but he bragged about it for, for many years afterwards. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and it never apparently, uh, uh, occurred to him that he might have been missing something. Uh, it, it, it it's not it's not true that there's a God spot. It's not validated that the uh, Persinger discovered a place you can stimulate and get religious thoughts. But, but I think this is revealing about the way, the way critics, uh, the most aggressive critics of, uh, of religion think um, that if they don't experience it, that means there can't be anything to it. <clears throat> and of course, we know that people have different brains. Okay. Okay, this is from uh, this is from Carrie Mel, and she asks this. She says, "You mentioned that you felt that you were more qualified to study religion because you yourself were religious at one point." She said, "I was wondering if the opposite could be true—that a negative religious experience can cloud one's judgment." She says, "I'm not coming at you. I'm just devastated by how often religion is used as a tool for abuse." And she says, secondly, as much as you have studied religion, have you yourself taken any spiritual practices from the amazing experiences you've had? You're muted, Mel, I think. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think I know people who had very negative experiences of religion and, um, uh, I think that that that's uh, unfortunately common. Uh, that religion can be a source of abuse. It ha happens. It happens to also be true that that science can be a source of abuse, and philosophy can be a source of abuse. And um, and and we we don't have to go through the examples of that. But it's it, it's clear that uh, atheistic societies like uh, like Stalinist uh, uh, Soviet Union and Maoist China and, and and many others have 
have bludgeoned people with uh, with supposedly scientific ideas, which, which in ways that are just as bad as anything religion has ever done. Um, I, I think that uh, I don't say that that um, g g having been once religious gives me uh, uh, you know uh, be all and end all of insights into into religion. I just say that when you when you approach the subject with no experience and no uh, and no um, sympathy, like many of uh, of the uh, people who who I've been talking about, uh, and, and you you it's like trying to uh, uh, it's like mounting an attack uh, on romantic love without ever having been there. Uh, and and so talking about how illogical it is and 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 uh, so so I'm not sure uh, I think there was more to Carrie's question than I've gotten to. Um, she just she wanted to know just real quickly. Do you have a do you, do you oh, oh do you my own yeah. So so to me, um, um, you know my my kind of religious mission is is trying to understand uh, human nature and, and experience and to teach about it and write about it and I I have uh, you know I wake up every morning and 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 the first thing I do after I have my coffee is is write and that puts me in a uh, what I consider a profoundly uh, spiritual state uh, and and uh, most of the good things I've accomplished in my life have come in in that state, which which I could say um, has a certain continuity with uh, uh, religious uh, impulses of my grandfather and people in my childhood, uh, but also my uh, my Christian Presbyterian wife, uh, uh, the Kung people in their trance dance and uh, the Hindus, the Buddhists that I've known, uh, it's, uh, it's my way of accessing, uh, an altered state of consciousness and a, and a connection with something that's bigger than what I can understand. And, and, and that's, yeah, I really appreciate that question because I never, I don't think I ever gave that answer uh, before. There's some more good ones coming. This is from Talon. Um, she said, do you think religion is declining over the last few decades? If so, why do you think that is, if, if it is? So, uh, yes and yes and no. Uh, I, 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 think, I think it's declining uh, partly for the reasons that um, that have been brought up by some of the critics that I uh, that I myself criticized. Uh, some people's I ideas about about God and some people's faith are really based on on not having explanations for uh, for the uh, terrible things that happen in life, for uh, the illogic uh, that we see around us and human behavior. Uh, uh, the the uh, people are are um, I think people are comforted by 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 religion uh, in in the face of those things and I I didn't I well, my closing uh, uh, my uh, you know uh, slides are about uh, basically depicting uh, religion and science as 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 two candles in a vast darkness. And uh, that that we have to face the fact that neither one of them um, is is uh, is what some of its proponents claim for it. Uh, uh, so many things that that no religion can explain. And I see that uh, 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 Sharna says uh, the diverse religions cause the world to have conflict with one another. Yes. Uh, what could explain these discrepancies when all is built on good faith? Well, unfortunately, part of part of of having these belief systems uh, is that that you come to depend on them, and and you 
you um, uh, can end up looking down on people who have different belief systems. And and uh, my answer to that is 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 ecumenism. Uh, it's it's not uh, abolishing faith. It's it's improving uh, uh, religious people's expect respect for other people's faith. Uh, and and I think that will be a lot easier to do. I think we see that happening. It'll be a lot easier to do than than, than uh, abolishing faith. But is is it declining? Yeah. So it's declining for sure in 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 Europe. It has it has declined a lot in in most Euro- European countries, especially Northern Europe. The United States was more or less immune to the to the decline, uh, but uh, for for decades, but has has entered into the same pattern to some extent. I was I was at a at a conference uh, uh, not too long ago with a bunch of people interested in science and religion, and a, and a, a Catholic priest said, uh, "You know, there are more Christians in the world today than there have ever been in the whole of history," and that's true. Uh, and and the reason it's true is because there's so many people in the developing world who have embraced Christianity or, for that matter, Islam. Uh, and 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 uh, uh, those are the main ones. But but um, there are many many religious people uh, that have in the developing world, especially that have uh, been immune to the. Uh, uh, to the uh, trends that, that that have caused religion to decline in in in, in Europe, uh, the yeah. So the 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 question is: Will eventually the the process of education and the spread of of modern medicine and science uh, cause religion to decline everywhere? I think possibly yes, uh, and and uh, that that I don't think is a terrible thing, um, but I think that there's there's such intense, there are such important differences between between people's brains, and, and there are there are very educated people uh, that you can find in every major religion, uh, very scientifically aware and uh, uh, people and and. Uh, uh, who who have studied philosophy and so on and and they haven't given up their faith so why not because they have they have uh, uh, they see something they feel something uh, uh, about the world and about life and and humanity and and spirituality that um, that not that other people don't necessarily feel I think those people will always exist and they might end up as a minor- minority and it might it might turn out that um, and and I, I had a sense of this while I was while I was arguing with those uh, critics of religion that, that the time may not be far away uh, where religious people uh, uh, are persecuted for for having faith rather than mm-hmm. persecuting others who don't have faith or who have a different faith. I don't say we're there yet. I'm just saying mm-hmm. it, it could happen. Okay. The next oh, question. I'll, I'll just put wait, one more point, which is religious people in every country and in every in every major religion, the the most religious people have the most children. Mm-hmm. So, from a Darwinian point of view, it's very hard for an anthropologist to predict the end of faith. Next question comes from David. Uh, what would you propose, or do you have a suggestion for a scientist who believes in a higher authority? Um, so, I, 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 I would, uh, first of all, refer to the fact that until, until uh, the 20th century, um, almost all scientists believed in a higher authority. Uh, um, they didn't necessarily have a, 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 a conventional religion, but they had, they had faith uh, of, of some kind. They thought there were things that they didn't understand. I mean... I, uh, uh, what I tell my first of all, and also you can refer to what Darwin says. Uh, uh, you know, at the end, uh, 
in a letter, another letter he said to to uh, a minister, I can't, you know, I can't figure this out. Um, but let each man hope and believe what he can. And and um, I think that that kind of tolerance is is lacking in the in the uh, just as much in in the, the severe critics of religion, who you might say are fundamentalist atheists, just like uh, or evangelical atheists. Um, and and they know they're right, so uh, so get out of get out of their way is their is their message, and and give up your your beliefs. But um, I tell my students that there's no necessary conflict. That real important religious leaders uh, of of every major faith, have, uh, including the Pope, have have said that we we can believe in evolution, that we can believe that evolution happened. Uh, they don't necessarily believe in a in an evolution which uh, is completely independent of of, of God uh, uh, or or divine intervention, um, but they they do uh, uh, they do find the compatibility uh, between their deep religious beliefs and and scientific uh, view of the world, and and I think that the you know religious people should. Uh, should not try to do what science does or replace what science uh, does as as they did say in the time of Galileo uh, and and um, but it still leaves a tremendous scope for religion uh, science can't tell you why there's something rather than nothing science can't tell you what the meaning of your life is science can't tell you how sh how you should live your life uh, science can't really tell you much about how you should find comfort in the face of all the uh, the terrible things that happen in life, or in the face of death, for that matter. And and wherever science can't can't do it for you, it seems to me that that leaves a domain for for faith. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, uh, it's really more a statement. I think you'll probably, based on your talk, I think you'll probably agree with this. The biologist colleague of mine, Heather, says, I fear that, I fear that framing the argument, as some do, that science in itself is against religion, will turn students of faith away from accepting scientific, scientific facts. I... I, I unfortunately uh, agree with that, and and, uh, and and I I try to work against it um, in my in my classes by by telling them outright that that there does not have to be a, 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 a relentless conflict between science and religion, and that I'm not here to challenge their faith. Uh, that you know, if I'm teaching about about what I understand about human evolution, it's hard to make it compatible with with what the Bible says in the first few chapters of Genesis. Um, but it, it's some people have found ways of doing that, and and uh, and it's okay with me. And and I also I also tell uh, I to, first of all I I I always tell students that my door is open to them. Uh, if they want to come and 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 talk about the problems they're having uh, with evolution or any other aspect of science as a, as a potential challenge to their faith, <clears throat> but uh, you know, I I also sometimes will say, uh, you know, if you believe in God, give God some 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 credit for imagination and knowledge and foresight. If 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 God is omniscient, then God could have made everything that we see happen um, by by creating a world that that, that uh, obeyed the world the laws of science that we're still you know busily trying to discover uh, don't 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 think that God has to have created the world uh, the way the way a potter makes a pot <laughs> uh, um, and and uh, and give give if you believe in God, give God scope for uh, for working through the laws of science and and the process of evolution. Here, here's another question. This is from Laurel, and she says or asks, "Do you miss do you miss having faith in a religion and having a higher power that you believe in?" Well, 
I, I actually, I often say that <clears throat> I consider my, my loss of faith at age 17 um, just that, a loss. Um, I've never bragged about it. Uh, I, I've, um, I, I suppose you could say that I've turned back to it certain, in certain ways since I, I, I like religious people and I have friends who are rabbis and ministers and, and Buddhist monks, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and we get along really well. And, uh, uh, a friend of mine, um, the Lutheran theologian uh, and theological ethicist named James Gustafson, uh, now, now in retirement in his mid nineties, um, uh, used to tell me that I was religious and, and, uh, I think what he was talking about was my my attitude toward toward understanding the world and toward interpreting the world and to finding a good path for for humanity in in the world. Um, so maybe I'm still religious in that in the in 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 those senses, and I, I certainly uh, you, you know I. I uh, I must say, I have times when I when I can envy someone who who can turn to prayer um, um, or meditation or 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 God or any aspect of faith uh, for comfort that I have to to find without those beliefs. There's another comment uh, that I think uh, just as it's really not a question as much as a comment, just saying how much they appreciated the word, the term evangelical atheist. They thought that was a, oh, a, a, a great term. Okay. There, I think we've got time for one more question. It's Sharna's question. I've got to find it here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sharna, I did not mean to skip it. I just, the diverse religions caused the world to have conflict with one another. That one. Yeah, that was it. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually read that, and and uh, what could explain these discrepancies when all is built on good faith? So, so um, there's no doubt that uh, religion has played into uh, the human tendency for for uh, intergroup uh, hatreds and and conflict, uh, but. You know, Nazism was not really a religious movement. Stalinism was an anti-religious movement. Uh, Maoism was an anti-religious movement. Um, terrible conflicts have occurred in the world that weren't uh, uh, mainly motivated by religious differences, and terrible conflicts have occurred that were motivated by religious differences. But you know, Karen Armstrong, who was a a former nun and and uh, and scholar of religion uh, uh, says that 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 religious <laughs> identities have been like a flag carried uh, by by warring armies that would have gone to war against each other for other reasons. <clears throat> Uh, having nothing to do with different interpretations of, of, of God. Um, I mean, John, you're an expert on the Civil War. Uh, uh, both sides thought they had God on their side, and they didn't actually have different religions, as far as I know, did they? <clears throat> no, and uh, Lincoln puzzled over that in his second inaugural. Both pray to the same God, both read the same Bible. You know, and uh, neither side got exactly what they wanted in this conflict, which was a really, uh, yeah, it's a pretty, really interesting <laughs> line. I think he puzzled over that uh, quite a bit. And 700,000 700, died. Yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah. Of course, or thereabouts, yeah. Well, look, Mel, I'd like to, uh, and everyone in the audience, I'd like for, to say thank you and thank you to everyone in the audience for uh, coming tonight and uh, and thanks for all those great questions. Yeah, yeah, and the book is I'm going to hold <laughs> it up is uh, Believers: Faith in Human Nature. You can get that on Amazon. Uh, 
Nice read, a good Christmas gift for somebody, right? Um, Mel and I talked earlier today and I have to put in one more plug since we now have a female vice president elect, the first in our history. This is the type of right. thing Mel writes about in his book, Women After All, that the long-term trends in world history are going to be beneficial to women and therefore to the world. So both of those or either would be great gifts for uh, a loved one over the holidays. So thank everybody for coming. Thanks. And thanks, uh, for the, thanks for the plug, John. Yeah. And thank <laughs> and you. Th Bill. And thanks. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks to the everyone who came and 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 uh, to those who asked quite great questions. All right. That's it. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.